Well, hi there. My name is Clint Laidlaw. I have an undergraduate degree in zoology, as well as a master's and a PhD in biology. I teach at a university, as well as run a biology outreach center called Clint's Reptile Room in Springville, Utah, with my incredible wife, Leisha. And two years ago, a really awesome person named Ireland brought in these two terrible animal skeletons to Clint's Reptile Room. And a movement was born. Well, this is now the third year that we have done this, and I'm honestly surprised how, with your help, new and dreadfully inaccurate Halloween decorations just seem to keep coming in. And we have some real dandies lined up for this year. And uh, if you look around, uh, most of them are even reptiles. This was a really good year for reptile skeletons. And even a couple of skeletons of animals that uh, I thought to be mythological, like last year's mermaid, which promised to teach us a great deal about the biology of these strange creatures. And yes, uh, the cat will make an appearance. It wouldn't be Halloween without it. Let's do this thing. This whole thing started with a bird. And this bird seems to have all of the same flaws as that bird. Namely, that it has bone feathers on its wings and its tail. Birds don't have that. They have a great deal of bone fusion in their wings and their tail, which is called the pygo style, uh, which looked nothing like this. And also that it lacks a keel on its sternum. This is, again, this isn't a surprising oversight. I've never seen them put one on a bird skeleton, but it does evidence that they never took so much as a glance at an actual bird skeleton before making this one. And I get it. Birds don't look much like birds without their feathers, but why no keel? Hummingbirds have the largest flight muscles for their size of any bird. Where are those muscles going to attach? Another thing that is massively wrong is the exceedingly short neck that this hummingbird has. I normally don't get into counting ribs and vertebrae, but this hummingbird has three cervical or neck vertebrae. Hummingbirds, real hummingbirds, have 14 to 15 cervical vertebrae. Birds in general have super long necks. Every now and then you'll see one stretch out its neck and it's truly amazing. Honestly, the ability of owls to turn their heads very far is much less shocking when you see what their necks actually look like. All those feathers just kind of keep that a secret. Like with the chameleon from last year, it lacks the hyoid apparatus, the bones used to move the tongue. They're very thin and delicate. I'd be shocked if they put them on, but they're so cool. Hummingbirds have a long forked tongue that they use to lap up nectar. They don't suck up nectar with their beaks. Well, in hummingbirds, the hyoid bones attach to the tongue under the chin and then wrap all the way around the skull, coming over the top and then attaching to the skull at the base of the beak, right up here. It's not surprising that they were omitted, but it is unfortunate. One thing that they got right, very right, is that the wings do not really bend in the middle. Hummingbirds do not fly like birds. They fly more like insects. You see, most birds fly sort of like you swim. They have a hard downward wing beat that provides thrust and lift, and then they fall while lifting the wings back up. To minimize how much air they push up during the upstroke, they fold the wings in. So it's sort of like this. Folded, out, up, out. That's what most birds do. Hummingbirds do something completely different. They use a similar downstroke to other birds, but when it comes time to bring the wing up, they just flip it over and do another downstroke. And this allows them to hover for extended periods of time, fly backwards, straight up, and generally just do things that no other birds can do. But the wing stays straight, just like they depicted it here. Well, at least sort of like they depicted it here. As with years past, I'm not trying to nitpick. Just discuss the things that it is crazy that they missed and highlight some of the things that they got shockingly right. And this frog skeleton is shockingly right. It's almost like, dare I say it, the person that made it actually looked at a frog skeleton. And I just want to compare it to last year's frog skeleton, which was a disaster. Okay, the main thing that last year's skeleton got right was the number of toes. Five on each hind limb and four on each forelimb. Well, this frog got that right. But uh, 
omitted the bone webbing, which is a big improvement. Unlike last year's frog, but like actual frogs, this skeleton lacks both ribs and a sternum. This one had a, a huge giant ribs and a colossal sternum, so it's a miracle. And it gets better still. Last year's frog had basically a human pelvis. F frogs do not. The frog pelvis looks uh, like this. It's long and skinny, not short and plate-like. Made up of two long ilia bones and a single Euro style in the middle. But what about the thing that last year's frog got astoundingly right? The back legs. Well, shock of all shocks, the artist that looked at a frog skeleton got that right too. It's almost like it isn't that hard. Frogs, even both of these frogs, have a femur like you do. But instead of a tibia and a fibula, they have a single bone tibiofibula and then paired tarsal bones. And these long tarsal bones are more accurate than last year's frog. So even in the place where they did the best last year, this one's better. And unlike last year's frog, they didn't just get the back legs right, but the front legs as well. It's a Halloween miracle! The front legs have a humerus, just like you and last year's frog, but unlike you and last year's frog, but like real frogs, they have a single bone radio ulna instead of a separate radius and ulna. And it even has carpal bones here in the hand. Last year's skeleton went straight from the radius and ulna to the metacarpals. Not a big enough error to highlight last year, but certainly something to celebrate this year. And though I wish that the holes for the eye sockets just went straight through like in real frogs, this skull does look essentially like a frog skull and not a toad with its eyeballs sucked out. This frog skeleton is welcome in Clint's Reptile Room. Thank you so much, Bianca Lewis, for sending this all the way from Australia, which is pretty cool. We wanted to take a moment to thank the sponsor of today's video, Follow. Follow makes these really cool, I, I think kind of bodacious bracelets. They've each one has an animal on it. This one, uh, which is the one that I like the best, has a shark on it. This would be Boo, my great hammerhead shark. But they've also got other things like sea turtles. We got one of those. Elephants, polar bears, penguins, lions, giraffes, dolphins. This bracelet all by itself is pretty cool, but that's really where the fun just begins because each one of these bracelets tracks a real animal out in the wild. For example, with my shark bracelet here, I learned that Boo lives part of the year down in the Bahamas, then heads up towards Florida, scoops down underneath and up on the Gulf side and up to the panhandle. And now I want to go out there and see if I can find Boo or any great hammerhead shark, because if I saw that, that would be awesome. And I learned all this because I got to follow Boo with my follow bracelet. How cool is that? And follow partners with conservation-focused organizations. So for my shark bracelet, for example, they partnered with and donated 10% of the net profits to Saving the Blue which is an organization that's all about recovering and restoring threatened marine species like sharks. So you get a cool bracelet, you get to learn about where they go and what they do on the map, and you get to contribute to some amazing conservation organizations. And if you use our link in the description and our discount code CLINT20, you'll get 20% off your purchase. Again, if you use our link and our discount code CLINT20, you'll get 20% off of your follow bracelet and you'll get to learn all kinds of cool things about a cool animal and show the world. All right, now where were we? Okay, I'm really excited about this next one. It is the first non-avian dinosaur skeleton that we have reviewed and it's a dandy. Obviously, the proportions are a bit cartoonish on this one, and I'm okay with that. It's a style, but it appears to be some sort of a dromaeosaurid, specifically Deinonychus, the velociraptor in Jurassic Park. Uh, this dinosaur, not, uh, not this dinosaur. We actually have a whole video about that. But they got some stuff pretty right, which is rather unsurprising because the majority of our knowledge of these animals comes from the skeletons that we have. Nobody has seen one in the flesh. If we're gonna get something right, 
Seems like it should be the skeleton. But I really appreciate that they got the antorbital fenestra on here. There's even some hint up here of the diapsid condition, which are these two holes behind the eye. The scapulae and pelvis are not, they're not wildly inaccurate, especially seeing how stylized the skeleton is. They couldn't hold their hands like this, but they did in Jurassic Park. And that is where I think that they did all of their research. In fact, I don't even think they made it to the kitchen scene. I'm not even sure they ever saw John Hammond. I think the only scene that they watched was this one. Look at the pubic bone, turned backward, just like a bird. Look at the vertebrae, full of air sacs and hollows, just like a bird. And even the word raptor means bird of prey. Because there was a part of that scene that really confused me as a kid in the world of before Google. Because when Dr. Grant describes Deinonychus, which he here calls Velociraptor for reasons that are described in our video all about it, well, well, I guess just listen to how he describes their feet. Because Velociraptor's a pack hunter, you see. He uses coordinated attack patterns, and he is out in force today. And he slashes at you with this. Six-inch retractable claw, like a razor, on the middle toe. Later, in the kitchen scene, when we get a look at those feet, well, the reality doesn't seem to match the description. But somebody didn't make it to the kitchen scene. Just check out those feet. Not only is that claw cartoonishly huge, but look which toe it's on. They don't match. But if your whole skeleton was based on this one scene on the desert with Dr. Grant, well, there it is. There it is. Let's talk next about this alligator skeleton, which identifies as a crocodile skeleton, but I'm pretty sure that's wrong for a few reasons. First, this skull makes no place for the fourth lower incisor to poke through. It is much more the shape of an alligatorid skull. But if you've seen our video on the crocodilians, then you would know that it could still be a caiman. However, if you've already seen that video, then you also know that the nostrils are not divided in the skulls of caimans. Not quite this much, but, but this much. And I think they're the only crocodilians with divided nostrils. Which along with the head shape also means that it's not a gharial or the other gharial. Even though the teeth on this guy are more similar to gharials than to alligators, as none of these teeth seem to go into sockets. In alligators, real alligators like this one, all of the bottom teeth fit into sockets in the upper jaw. But overall, this skeleton's really pretty good. I'm very impressed with their attempt to show the diapsid condition, which would be this hole here and this hole here. Though the back of the skull should be much longer. The eyes of alligators are about a quarter to a third of the skull's length from the back. Not pretty much all the way to the back. The leg and foot anatomy is not only pretty good, but they get the toe counts right. Five on the front, four on the back. Some research happened. I'm pleased. And Dave, I still love this skull. Thank you so much. But you know what I don't love? Octopus skeletons. But this one from last year at least redeemed itself by calling itself a skeleton octopus and not an octopus skeleton. Because octopodes don't have skeletons. And the only hard part of their anatomy, the beak, was not even present on this abomination. So the leading hypothesis is that these skeleton octopuses were created from the bones of vertebrates by a necromancer somewhere. Fine. But where did he get these bone suckers? Well, this year, we have a new skeleton octopus. And it also has bone suckers. And no beak. Or siphon. But this mantle has an all new composition. Last year's octopus had an angry face with skull-like sutures, but the mantle was composed of a rib cage and a vertebral column. Looked quite menacing. This year's octopus looks like a faceless baby human skull, except without a big hole in it about here. Until I get to the bottom of the skull where it looks like a burlap sack that was tied off. I don't, I don't really know what this fringe is for. Honestly, where is the necromancer getting these bones? I just don't think this hypothesis holds water. But you know what will? This armadillo! which was sent to us by Stephen Finette from California. It's hollow on the inside. And honestly, despite the fact that armadillos are not hollow, they have a complete mammal skeleton in there, I have no problem with this. This isn't an anatomical model. It's a decoration. 
I think it's not unreasonable to make it anatomically correct, but only with regard to the parts that you will see. And armadillos are some of my favorite mammals. They're on my short list of mammals that I would like to have here at Clint's Reptile Room. And this one appears to be a three-banded armadillo. There are two species of three-banded armadillos, and of the 21 or so armadillo species, they are the only ones that I know with three bands in their shell articulation. They're also the only armadillos that can conglobate themselves completely. That is, that they can roll into a complete ball. Conglobate is just one of those words that you should use whenever possible. These conglobating three-banded armadillos also have a, a rather short tail, like this guy. But this head, it looks more like that of a nine-banded armadillo that we have here in the United States. Many armadillos have long faces like this one, but not three-banded armadillos. And the armor of the head contours around the eye in a way that you don't see on three-banded armadillos. So this is kind of a mix-and-match armadillo. Really what we have here is a shell, we've got part of the legs, the feet, the tail, and the head. A head that's from a different armadillo. Now, many years ago, someone at the university gave me this shell of a nine-banded armadillo. And one very cool thing about it is that, well, uh, and I apologize that it wasn't cleaned perfectly, you never look a gift shell in the excess fascia. But the cool thing is that from the inside, you can clearly see the network of tile-like osteoderms. The shell is covered with keratin on the outside, but it has a bony interior, so I have no problem with it being included as part of the skeleton. But unlike turtles, which we will discuss soon, it isn't attached directly to the rest of the skeleton. Armadillos have ribs and a spine, but they're just inside of the shell. I suppose that it would actually be possible to remove the shell of an armadillo without killing it, but it wouldn't be easy or painless, and it would probably kill it, but not as much as if it were a turtle. The tail and the head also have armor, but it too could be separated from the skeleton, at least potentially. And again, I'm fine with it being left on this guy. And armadillos without their armor, I mean, they just look like small anteaters anyway, which really isn't that far off. But they're not aardvarks. It's really a shame that they didn't do a better job on the feet of this guy. Their front feet do have only four toes, so the claws are much larger for digging. And the back feet do have this process off of the back, and they do stand plantigrade with the whole foot on the ground. But their inner three toes, what Dr. Grant would probably call the middle three toes, but th their inner three toes, they share one huge, almost hoof-like claw. It's a shame that this one doesn't have anything like that. The skull may be of the wrong species of armadillo, but it looks dang good. It even has teeth in the right places. This isn't perfect, but I think that if you went through the Google search history of the artist that made this, armadillo skeleton would actually show up somewhere. And that's really all that I'm asking here. You may already be aware that many of your favorite reptile YouTubers are coming here to Clint's Reptile Room for our grand opening on October 20th and 25th. First, you might even be aware that there's going to be a reptile rampage of sorts. You might not be aware that there are still tickets available to this event at clintsreptiles.com, but you might live too far away to come and actually see this event live and in person. However, there will be a way to see it live because we will be live streaming the Reptile Rampage as well as a number of the other events from the Clench Reptile Room Grand Opening for our patrons on Patreon. So if you don't support us already and you'd like to see this live, you can either come in person or you can support us on Patreon. We hope to see you there. Oh no. This is actually the third skeleton that we have had for one of these. These are the other two. And uh, this one is the second worst one. This one is the worst. So this is a two-headed cobra sent to us by Katie Hergert from right here in Utah. And the funny thing is that the fact that it has two heads is not one of the problems with it. Bicephaly, while uncommon, has been observed many, many times in snakes, turtles, and other reptiles. In fact, it happens in all sorts of animals, including humans. I have seen photographs of two-headed cobras. So the fact that it is a two-headed cobra, not an issue. This happens. Usually as the result of an incomplete separation from what would have otherwise been identical twins. 
Or, more rarely, the incomplete fusion of mono or dizygotic twins, like what happened with Dwight. But the problem here is that this is not what a cobra's skeleton looks like. For one thing, snake skeletons have tons of ribs. Not quite as many as this one, but a lot. They stop right about here at the tail, so they don't just continue on all the way to the end. But they do have ribs. This snake only has ribs in its hoods. And the cobra hood is the ribs spread out. I think the likelihood of two heads sharing ribs like this one is small, but this is honestly one of the highlights of this skeleton. Well, this in the fact that it has a skeleton at all. But the skull is terrible. It doesn't look like a snake skull. This is, once again, a snake, or a, I guess a pair of snakes, with their eyes sucked out. Snakes in reality have very delicate heads. These are incredibly burly heads. And their lower jaw is not connected in the middle, so it can stretch wide open when they feed. We have a whole video about this. This artist, I mean, at least they took the time to Google if snakes have skeletons, but they clearly stopped before doing any kind of image search. I just revisited the store where I got the invisible snake skeleton, and this... <laughs> <laughs> and now that I've had my kitty for two years, I think that he needs a name. What should we... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> what should we name my beautiful kitty? While you think about that, let's take a look at the vertebrate skeleton of another invertebrate, shall we? This monstrosity was sent to us by our friend Veronica. Like all of the spiders and scorpions that we've seen before, Butterflies are arthropods. This means that they have an external exoskeleton, not a vertebrate internal endoskeleton. So a butterfly skeleton, well, it looks like a butterfly. I'm gonna be as charitable as I can. Let's go with your now defunct necromancer hypothesis. It doesn't hold water for octopi, but what about arthropods? Well, at best, it looks like your necromancer doesn't know what a butterfly looks like. For one thing, butterflies are crustaceans in the clade Hexapoda. Hexapoda, for you non-Greek speaking necromancers, means six feet. Butterflies have six feet, each with their own leg, not two. And butterflies feed with a curly proboscis that extends out into essentially a straw, not this. This honestly looks like what would happen if tetrapod vertebrates, four feet, convergently evolved into a butterflyish form. Like all tetrapods with true wings, you can see that the wings have formed from the forelimbs. We'll talk more about that soon. Because I only have four creatures left, and only two of them have four appendages. The other two have more. But let's talk about my tortoise. He is also empty inside. I know that he is a he because that tail is way too long to be from a female tortoise. I can't tell if the plastron is concave because, uh, he doesn't have one. But like the armadillo, I'm okay with this. It's a decoration. I can see that it's a tortoise from the fact that it doesn't shed the scoots on its shell. But it's also not a tortoise, and I can tell that because of the way that it stands, plantigrade with the whole foot on the ground. Tortoises are digitigrade, standing on their toes like ballerinas. Ballerinas with their ribs and vertebral column fused into a big old shell. This face is also more box turtle. So apparently the makers of hollow-shelled animal skeletons like to create hybrid creatures. But once again, really isn't too bad. The scoots are pretty accurate in their shape and configuration. The skull is a reasonable approximation of what a box turtle skull looks like. The stance is reasonable for a box turtle, though they do have one more toe on each foot. It's not perfect, but it doesn't bring great shame upon the reptile room to have it in here. This, on the other hand, I have chosen to call Triracosaurus because it can't seem to decide if it's a Styracosaurus or a Triceratops. It has the frill of a Styracosaurus, the facial horns of a Triceratops, and larger jugal spikes than either of them. And it has the neck of... no neck. It traded it for jugal spikes, and it traded two of its toes on each foot for extra ribs in its lumbar vertebrae which it also gave to the alligator that we looked at earlier. I just, I just don't know what's going on with this pelvis, but it isn't an ornithischian pelvis. If you want to know more about that pelvis, check out our video on the largest and smallest of each group of dinosaurs from last Dinosaur December. And subscribe if you don't want to miss our dinosaur content coming out this year. But first, 
<laughs> let's talk about this. This, I believe, is a griffin, which is a chimeric animal like our Tyracosaurus. But in this case, I think it's supposed to be an eagle mixed with a lion, isn't it? But I honestly don't see a lion in there. Maybe no eagle either. This looks like a falcon mixed with another falcon, the torso of a dachshund or maybe a corgi, and the tail I suspect to be made of the rough horsetail plant. Is that a thing? I can tell it's a falcon and not an eagle because it has a tomial tooth, kind of this, this tooth-like projection here on the beak. Eagles don't have this. Neither do hawks, vultures, or any of their other close relatives. But falcons, which are more closely related to parrots and songbirds, do. And uh, this does. Unlike lions, it has anisodactyl feet, where the first toe points backwards. And that is true for all four feet. So none of these feet come from a lion. Though I suspect that the front legs above the feet, I mean, that, that could be from a lion. A lion with a tibio fibula. So probably from a frog. That said, I suspect that this skeleton isn't even from a real griffin. I mean, look at how they attach the falcon neck to the corgi body. It's like they weren't even trying to hide that it's a fraud. And I suspect that I know why. Look at the wings. Do you know what these look like? They look like the wings of an actual freaking bird. This has never been done in the history of Halloween skeleton decorations. If you were the first skeleton artist to actually glance at the skeleton of a bird's wing, there is no way that you would want people thinking it was just some run-of-the-mill, everyday, real griffin skeleton. You would want to make it clear as day that you did something remarkable. Something that had never been done before. And I salute you for it. But we can't end on that triumphant note. Because we have one more hexapodal vertebrate. And this one has none of the telltale signs of being a fraud, but it does have something remarkable that we've never seen before. This is a dragon. And don't be discouraged by his diminutive size. This is the real deal. This is probably the realest deal dragon that I have ever seen. Well, other than the bone ears. We almost made it through one of these without running into any bone ears. The armadillo somehow avoided that ever so common pitfall of mammal skeletons. And given that mammals are the only ones with fleshy external pinnae, I thought we might be in the clear this year. But apparently dragons have converged with mammals in this way. But theirs are bone. Probably often mistaken for extra horns. We can tell because this dragon skeleton is the real deal. Now what is it Exactly. Well, the presence of the antorbital fenestra suggests that it is probably a dinosaur. And its three-toed feet and Sarisian-like pelvis would suggest that it is most likely a theropod dinosaur. But this is not a fossilized skeleton. So how did dragons manage to survive the extinction event that killed most of the other dinosaurs? For that, I need to point you to the reason that the other lineage of dinosaurs survived. If you recall from our video on this subject, the only dinosaurs that survived the extinction event at the end of the Cretaceous were small, flighted, and big-brained. Well, this creature is small. It has wings and something else I will get to in a second that suggests that it could fly. And big-brained. Dragons are notorious for their cunning. And if they're all really this size, then not only have they convinced humans that they're smart, they have convinced us that they're, in fact, huge far too large to fly, that they breathe fire, uh, do fly somehow, and destroy villages. But the thing that convinces me most that this is a real deal dragon and no hoax is that it is impossible for the artists that make these Halloween skeletons to have made this. Not only is it small enough to fly, but strong enough too. It has a thing that these artists do not know to exist, a keeled sternum. And I'm just thankful that I've had the opportunity to share this truly unprecedented find with you. And if you wanna see me do this again next year, it's getting harder and harder to find new skeletons. So please help us out. We'll have an address down in the description. As always, like and subscribe, and we'll see you real soon. Uh, Clint. Yo. I like your time. Thank you. I just switched into it from a regular blue dinosaur tie to a blue skeleton tie.
just for today. Seems appropriate. It does, it does. We can have a link to it in the description. <laughs> I believe it is available on the Amazon. <laughs>